My next presentation um, is going to be on data-driven synthesis of full probabilistic programs. Uh, and it's going to be given by Sarah Chasen. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. I'm going to be talking about data-driven synthesis of full probabilistic programs, where by full, we mean that we're not going to actually ask the user to write any code. We're just going to make it directly from the data set using the synthesizer. Uh, so before we dig in on how we're actually going to do the synthesis, let's go back and review for a moment what a PPL is. So a lot of you will be familiar with Bayes nets. So we're going to go over an example here, probably one that some of you will have seen. There's going to be some events that will happen with some probability, so a burglary that will happen with some pretty low probability, an earthquake that will also happen with a pretty low probability. Each of those events, if they do happen, will affect the chances that, say, your burglary alarm would go off. And that, in turn, could affect the chances that your neighbors will call to tell you that you have been robbed. So when we usually represent this, what we're going to actually see is a set of nodes and for each of these nodes, we'll, for each of these node pairs, we'll see an edge between them if there is a direct dependence. If there's an indirect one, we don't see an edge because that one's not so key. And of course, the way we really start to understand what's happening here is we actually get into the conditional probability tables, the CPTs that are showing us the exact chances of each of these events occurring and how that actually depends on the things with the direct dependences. So that's the sort of program that we're actually going to be working with, but we will be representing it a little differently. So this can all be translated directly into a PPL program. For instance, this is the blog language program for the very same model that I just showed you. If you take a close look at the parameters, you'll see that they are exactly the same numbers that you saw in the CPT. And I think all of us can probably read this and pretty much figure out what's going on. So this is the sort of program that we're going to be trying to synthesize. And of course, one of the things that we want to ask is, why do we even care about having a model in this particular format? So the first and, and probably the coolest answer is that it gives us access to really, really sophisticated inference algorithms. So modern PPLs like Blog, they will let you do all kinds of cool queries, like, for example, so this one's a simple one. The idea here is we know something about a particular state of the world. We have observed that Mary has called us. So should we believe that a burglary has actually happened? What are the chances? And so if we add these particular lines of code to that PPL model that I already showed you, we would get this answer. So it turns out eh, it's probably still not a burglary. They're pretty rare. Um, so maybe we want to do another quick analysis here. What if both of them have called us? Should we start to believe it then? Turns out still pretty much no. It's still pretty rare. Um, but you know, a little more confidence, so that's pretty cool. And then we might start asking some new questions. So if we're a social scientist and we've just gotten a nice new model in this shiny PPL and we want to start wondering about interventions that we might run, we might take a look at this model and we'd be saying that, oh, it looks like Mary's only calling us 70% of the time when this burglary is actually, when the burglary alarm is going off. Maybe we could persuade her to call almost every time. Would we have more confidence then? Maybe this is an intervention we should run. And it turns out, you know, it's, it's not really going to raise our confidence that much. So that's probably not a good intervention. You probably shouldn't pursue that. And then when it gets really cool is we can start actually turning these models into predictors and classifiers. So here we have an example where we're looking at some flight data, and we have the day on which the flight is going to run, we have the time at which it will depart, and we want to start predicting, OK, what, what is the distribution of times when the, the distribution of basically flight delay times? And of course, that's no longer just true and false. What we're actually going to get there is a distribution. And it's really easy to go from something like that to essentially a predictor, or in the case of a categorical variable, to something like a classifier. So this is really fun stuff. And this, you know, you can see that these queries are, are actually quite simple. We could put that in the hands of social scientists and other folks who aren't too used to coding. And we could give them access to these really, really cool inference algorithms that are going to do a lot of this work for them. Um, so what happens right now to get access to these queries and to these models is people just write them by hand. So you just saw those queries. Those were pretty straightforward. It's probably reasonable to expect people to write those by hand. You just saw one slide of them, and you could probably all write them right now. But for the PPL model, that's a lot more to ask. So first, you have to actually understand the data you're trying to model. So getting insights into, especially if it's a very large data set, that can be really tough. You have to figure out what things are actually affecting each other, in what form are they actually affecting each other. And then even once you have those insights, which are already really hard to gather, you have to put it in this precise statistical form. So now all of a sudden, you have to understand Gaussian distributions. You have to understand beta distributions. You have all the statistical knowledge that you have to gain and then apply to create 
that program. So, you know, the blog program that I just showed you that had the burglary, that was fairly straightforward. Maybe we could ask people to write that, but as soon as we start getting to things with real valued random variables, it's starting to get a lot more complicated, and pretty much it quickly adds up to being a really big task. So our idea was, let's actually have the machine do this. Let's actually make a synthesizer that's going to just take the data, turn it into one of those PPL models, take that particular part of the task out of the human user's hands. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on right now. We're not going to look at the inference algorithm again. Right now, we're just focusing on, let's get that PPL model. OK, so the problem statement. There's a class of answers that we would consider acceptable. The first thing is it had better actually model all of the variables in that data set that we're going to give it. So that's the primary thing. Each of these is going to represent one of the topologies that we could accept. Um, you can see that there's actually, well, sort of you can see, that there's actually supposed to be multiple um, versions of each of those topology because, of course, we're also learning the CPTs. So each of those topologies actually corresponds to a whole range of actual concrete models. So now that we have the, the restriction where we're actually going to be using all the particular random variables from the input data, the next restriction is the user's causal order hypothesis. So basically what this is going to say is if there's a relationship between the earthquake and the alarm going off, it's that the earthquake caused the alarm, the alarm didn't cause the earthquake. You're not saying whether there was actually a relationship, you're just saying if there was, this is the direction it would be. And so you can see that one of these models, it looks as though burglary alarms actually cause burglaries. We don't like that, let's throw that out. And then our next restraint will be the user doesn't want to actually have some big model that has a bunch of connections that aren't really significant, but don't really mean much about the actual underlying data. So the user can restrict the size, and that's going to actually cause us to throw out this one where you see all those unnecessary connections. We already saw what the model should actually look like. All right, so that's the space of models that we're willing to accept. Now let's get on to actually what the general task is. So basically, we're going to be given a set of samples. It's a data set. It's going to look like something like that that you see on the right. We're going to get that causal order hypothesis. What direction do these connections flow in? And then finally, we're going to get a target size. And once we have those, what we actually want to get is the best model P of up to size K that doesn't contradict the causal order hypothesis and that actually maximizes the likelihood of the program given the data. Now, that's a strong goal. We're actually going to be quite approximate in that, but that's the actual target. All right. So the contributions, first and foremost, it's the first synthesizer that actually generates a full PPL model. There have been past work on filling holes in existing PPL models. We wanted to actually go straight to the PPL model from just the data set. Um, we're also using a data-guided stochastic technique that actually generates better candidates during our stochastic synthesis process. So that speeds up synthesis quite a lot. We're also going to compare a few techniques for generating those topologies that you just saw. And finally, we're actually going to create an algorithm for adjusting the program size after the main synthesis process so that the user can explore some different program sizes. All right, let's get on to the tool. So basically, we're breaking the synthesizer down into three stages. First is actually going to generate those topologies that you just saw. Once we've got that, we'll do some stochastic synthesis, get to a full program that has a good score. Once we have one that has a good score, we'll pass it on to the program structure reducer that will hopefully give us a smaller version of that same program that eliminates some of those unnecessary connections. We'll take these one at a time. Starting with program structure generation, this is quite straightforward. We get that causal order hypothesis. From that, we're just going to take the transitive closure, get a topology, moving right along to the next stage. So in this stochastic synthesis approach, we're actually going to be taking in that topology we're going to be creating a sketch, a program that has holes in it. We're going to fill that. We're going to repeat the process a number of times until we have one that we like. The way we're doing that is using simulated annealing. So for those of you who have actually worked with that before, you know that the main thing you're going to need is a way to generate a candidate and then a way to score a candidate. The way we're going to generate it is to first make a random mutation, and then based on that change, we're actually going to tune it to the input data. And then we're actually going to score the candidate by estimating the likelihood of the program given the input data. So making the first sketch is pretty straightforward. We're going to make a program structure that represents the topology. Um, we will be allowed to actually change the concrete program structure, but not in ways that will affect the topology. Once we actually have some real programs that we're working with, we can start doing stochastic mutations. So you can see here we've made a pretty simple one. We switched from having a 15 threshold to having a 16 threshold. The weird thing, the thing that doesn't normally happen in stochastic synthesis, is we have now gone through all the descendant distributions and blanked out their uh, parameters and replaced those with holes. So that's a little funky. How are we actually going to complete those? 
And of course, the reason we're doing this is that we have all that input data and we want to tune it for that. So basically what we'll do is we'll look at the path condition of the distribution we're trying to complete right now. We'll go ahead and turn that path condition into a filter for the input data. So here you can see we're looking at the case where both burglary and earthquake were true. We have gone through and highlighted the rows that actually have those both true. And we will use that to actually fill in the parameter. Pretty straightforward. And that gives us a, a more complete program, an actual complete program that we could run, and more importantly, at this point, that we can score. So at this point, we'll actually produce a score by estimating the likelihood. Uh, we have to do an estimation because past work has shown, uh, past work on a tool called psketch that did partial PPL synthesis, has shown that it's just too slow to do the exact computation. We follow the same general technique of using a mixture of Gaussians, but we add support for a few different distributions. And from that, we're ready to actually do program structure reduction. The idea here is let's get rid of those unnecessary connections that we didn't actually need. Um, here, we're asking, do we actually need to make that distinction on John calls? Whether Mary calls, is that actually dependent on whether John calls? In this case, the parameters are somewhat similar. They're not super similar. Maybe we wouldn't automatically think that we could collapse those. But if we know that, for example, one of those was tuned with just two rows of data, eh, maybe it was just random chance, maybe we're willing to collapse it. And so that's how we're making those decisions. So how similar are the parameters and how much data was actually used to tune them? And although it may not look like a big difference on this branch by branch basis, once we get to uh, you know, the whole program, it's actually making a pretty big difference. And we're actually getting rid of a lot of those unnecessary connections, which makes uh, nice, much nicer, cleaner models. And with that, we're ready to do eval. So we had a benchmark suite, 14 benchmarks. Each of them was associated, first and foremost, with a blog program, basically our ground truth that we actually used to generate two data sets. So one test data set, one training data set, both with 10,000 rows, so pretty big. And I want to get back just a moment to how we created those topologies. What I said earlier about using the transitive closure, that was sort of true. We actually tried a few different approaches. Uh, it turned out the transitive closure one was the one that works best, so that's why we're focusing there. But so you'll see a few different strategies reflected in the chart here. The question, how fast is synthesis? So for the transitive closure approach, the one that we liked best, that one that worked best, uh, it turns out it's actually on average less than 21 seconds, so we're very satisfied with that. Um, we also wanted to know how accurate are the output programs. And the way we evaluated that is we actually looked at the um, likelihood of the original ground truth programs, and we compared that to the likelihood of the output programs from synthesis. And it turns out that we're basically at that normalization line, so we're, we're very happy there. We also wanted to know, does the size reduction actually hurt accuracy? Are we shooting ourselves in the foot when we're eliminating these connections that we thought were unimportant? Is that algorithm actually performing well in that it's reducing size without actually sacrificing accuracy, and it turns out, yes, we're getting pretty strong, pretty solid size reductions, but we're not actually seeing the accuracy fall too much. And then the final question that we really wanted to answer was, can this actually handle real data? It's great to have these ground truths, because then we can figure out if we're actually getting the right output program. But we also want to make sure that we can actually extend to real data sets that people really want to run on. So we used an uh, airline delay data set. It was a data set of about 400,000 flights. Uh, we synthesized a program that actually reveals characteristics that past analyses have found. And when I say it revealed that, I mean we looked at the program text and we just saw, oh yeah, it looks like over the course of the day we we're actually seeing later and later delays. So that was interesting. But the really cool thing was that we actually used Blog's built-in algorithms to make a predictor. So this was a really, really simple change. Basically, all you have to do is say, OK, I observed that this was you know, the time it left. I observed that this was, well, the time it was scheduled to leave. I observed that this was the day of the week. And basically, you observe all the things that are known. And then you add the query statement for the thing that you want to find out, in this case, the delay. So really, very straightforward change, one that we could have applied to any of these features. Um, we just happened to pick delay. We found pretty good prediction error, given that the, the range of prediction errors was quite large, and we found we did better than a baseline. So overall, we were, I would say this is preliminary evidence that it really can run on real data. And with that, I would love to take any questions that folks might have. Uh, we've actually got plenty of time. Uh, so please do make your way to the microphone if any questions. Hello. Uh, so you 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 mentioned the P sketch and I guess PyMC and other other tools can can do similar stuff where you have holes and I think the holes are mostly uh, the the parameters of the distribution. Is that is that right? 
I believe they can do somewhat larger holes. Uh, if you want them to generate hidden variables, mm -hmm. you can say what variables you want to affect it. I haven't brushed up on that a while. I'd have to take another look okay. back at so it. So I, I just wonder if, I mean, one of the contributions of this work is that you can actually infer the, the structure of the program. Um, so you can simulate that using um, the holes that pSketch supports. So um, have you tried doing that? Oh, have I tried having them actually create the whole topology? Yes. No, we have not. So we did take a little look at whether we could expect it to scale by basically looking at how quickly they uh, learned the partial burglary program versus how quickly we learned the whole thing. And it turned out we were learning the whole thing more quickly than they were learning the partial. So we decided not to actually run that comparison, but I do think it would be really interesting to see, for sure. Cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, so I was wondering, what was the baseline predictor you used for the uh, air airline delay uh, case study? It was a very trivial baseline. It just guessed the average. Nothing exciting there. Uh, did you also try some other tools, uh, other methods, other better, potentially um, less trivial baselines? I, I do think that would be very cool. We have not done it, but yeah, I, I would love to. I don't think this is really going to be a way for people to generate real predictors that are going to you know, compete against the best and brightest of ML. This is really more for exploring and figuring out, you know, does this model represent something about the real world? All right. So uh, can you also comment whether the goal of that reduction that you're doing was to increase readability or is this about computational costs? I mean, what was the uh, goal setting there? It was a number of things. So we started out being mostly interested in readability because we are especially interested in making this accessible to data scientists, social scientists, the sort of people who might want to get some insights into what's actually going on in this model. Uh, but yeah, it also does mean that inference will run more quickly if you have the smaller model. So that is a, a another primary goal there, for All sure. Right. OK. Um, so let's ask um, again uh, if there's anybody who wants to ask a question. No? Uh, yes, please. So the likelihood estimate is one way of uh, measuring accuracy. Speaking of insights, uh, have you looked at other kinds of uh, ways of comparing accuracy of programs? Or uh, So doing something like the predictor model on a test, test slash holdout data set, or? Uh, generally, other metrics for comparing. Uh, are you looking at other metrics of comparing accuracy of these probabilistic programs? It's something that I'm interested in. It's not something that I've done so far. And can you comment on why uh, the likelihood estimation here makes the most sense? Why did you choose that as the, uh, as the metric? For that, we were mostly following what PSketch had done before us. I see. Uh, we liked the general approach that they were taking. We mostly just wanted to expand it to additional distributions. It seemed to be working well in their case. Thanks. All right, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>